Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alliance of Independent Authors Self Publishing Salon. And we have a new salon for you. I am here with Mr. Dan Blank. Hi, Dan. Hey, how are you? And we have added, uh, by popular request, a writing salon to our collection of, of self publishing salons. So we also do a beginner's publishing salon each month and we do an advanced publishing salon each month and there we're talking all about the business of you know making great books selling great books and so on but very little talking um about creative writing which is the reason that uh, a lot of us are in this thing in the first place if not all of us so uh, yeah dan and i uh, both share an interest in the creative um, process a, a deep interest and so we thought it would be nice if we would spend 2019 just talking about writing so here we are so we will take your questions on any aspect of what we're talking about today we're going to kick off with something that we both feel very strongly about and that is when we hear authors saying you know i love writing but i hate marketing and both Dan and I think that's a false dichotomy. And I'm going to call on Dan, who has written a whole book, really, and not just about this, but, but this kind of feeds into very much called Be the Gateway. Um, am I putting words in your mouth? Is that how you would express it? Yeah, I think that's a perfect way to talk about it. Yeah, I I think it's just when when also say that I think the split is just completely in the wrong place. Writing is writing, and all of the things that we do to market a book involve writing as well. And today we want to talk about why that writing is creative writing too. How to think about it in a more creative way, and how to use that writing to ultimately engage the people you want to follow you and to read you and um, and buy your books. So talk to us, uh, let's kick off talking a little bit about Be The Gateway, Dan. Tell me about where that book came from and it summarize all those pages in a few <laughs> sentences, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Be The Gateway kind of hangs its hat on this metaphor, this idea of of crafting a gate and really thinking about what it is that drives you to be interested in what you write about and how do you communicate that so the first step is building that gateway and it's separate from your writing from your books but it's related to it it's talking about well why did you write this novel why did you write this memoir how do you talk about those themes and i think that that the first thing there is a lot of writers have a very difficult time putting that into words you ask them about what they're writing and they kind of start apologizing and they tell you the background, they tell you the, the 5,000 word version of it and then they backtrack a little bit and they don't really get it down. So I think the first step there is to understand what you write and why and how to communicate that. Uh, and that's sort of the gateway. And the second part of the, the metaphor is this idea of opening the gate, of actually going out into the marketplace, going out with real people, because inherently the idea of publishing a book is to make public. So this idea, it's not just, I wrote this, this thing. You want people to read it. You want people to kind of consume it, to become a part of it. So the second part of this process is actually go out there and to talk to people, to learn about who engages with these topics, what engages them, where are they? And the third part is to just walk someone through the gate. And the way I like to think about this is it's not about building an audience or getting followers, although I'm happy to work with writers on that all the time. It's about leading one person through the gate of having one connection with a possible reader or a reader about what you write and why you, you write it. And I think that's how I approach the whole topic of marketing and platform is this very human connection between the author and the reader. Yeah, and and as I was saying earlier, I think that's where you and I really kind of come together. I think of it as two imaginations kind of melding in this magic place, you know, where you both go off into the pages of a book and and connect together and in some way finding. And it it is hard for a writer to know exactly why they write um, and to put that down in words and then to find the way that kind of conveys because what you're what you're actually trying to do is not say 
spell it out in so many words. If you could do that succinctly, you probably never would have written a book in the first place. And mm -hmm. um, it's because it's a bit mysterious for you and you're making it up as you go along and you're following a need of your own. The reader has that need too, um, and but it is an imaginative need and it's a little bit mysterious. So what you're really trying to do, I think, in the creative writing that you do around the book, uh, which would include things like the book description, um, copy for advertising even, um, copy for social media updates, all that kind of writing. We even call it by a different word. We call it copy and we call, you know, creative writing over here. This is copywriting here as if it is in some way different. And what is different is, I think, possibly the intent that, you know, you sat and you wrote a book, possibly because you had no other choice. Some great longing came on you to do so. But when you sit down to do a, a Facebook ad, you're doing it with the intention of bringing people through the gateway. So because the intention is different, the writing can become very different. It can become very cold. And your experience of actually putting that writing together, you can start to feel cold and feel, uh, you know. So it's how do you go back in and get the magic going in the in the writing that you do around the book you know it's funny I, th I think a lot of writers get stuck on this idea of the publication of their book they think that that's the goal i want this thing and i want it to be in a bookstore i want someone to be able to buy it and i think the book is a perfect form i think it's magical and the idea they're actually publishing the book is an incredible milestone and you were you were saying this earlier in different words, but the work isn't complete until someone reads it. And you talked about that meld that happens. And I think that when you think about how to write anything else that connects someone to the book, it, it really is understanding your purpose beyond the publication. This idea of, let's say your book sold a, a million copies and you are gonna be uh, doing a book signing at the biggest bookstore in, in London. And there's 400 people online and they all come up to you and they're all going to say something to you. They all want to talk to you. What is that conversation going to be? And you might not know, but you might think, you know, I, I bet someone's going to touch upon the, this character a lot or this choice or this context. Um, you know, I got to um, meet JK Rowling at a big signing in New York City. And it was so great because you see people crying. You see them like this, this guy was clutching a letter that had like the um, the stamp on the back to seal it, holding it to give it to her. And you're like, what is happening here? What is it that people connect with? And that's what I think is so beautiful about all of the aspects of how you connect with the reader outside of the book, um, because you're in inherently experiencing that thing that's otherwise hidden from authors. You know, someone buys your book on Amazon, they reads it, you have, you, have, they have, you have no idea what happens. But in all these other social media ways and newsletters and blogging and in person, you have that opportunity to experience it. And I think it, it helps, it should help writers think about their goals beyond publication. What kind of conversations do you want to be having and why? Exactly. Casting the mind back. I mean, if you ask an author, they'll say they want fame and fortune and sell loads of books and, you know, be on the big chat shows and, you know, but actually you don't have to go down very deep before you realize that there is a much uh, there is a much deeper need going on. And I'm old enough to remember when you put a book out and it was deafening silence you had your launch if you were lucky and the publisher coughed up and people drank warm wine and <laughs> felt obliged to buy a book and off they went and the only communication you had with your reader after that was the reviewers in the press and then if somebody actually sat down and wrote a, a snail mail letter you know in handwriting and and you they sent that to your agent maybe or to your publisher and eventually it might make its way to you and it was such a distance between you and your readers and it was very hard to have that sort of understanding um, and there wasn't the opportunity either for the author to in a sense position ourselves in the way that we want our books to be received the publisher decided how that was going to be and it was very much about selling it into a bookstore and finding the magic words that would get a bookstore to accept it long enough to keep it on the shelves for long enough for readers to find it which is a whole different kind of marketing 
but we can actually do I hesitate to even call it marketing because it instantly puts authors off, but we can do that kind of communication ourselves. We can use our own words, set up our own positioning, talk to people in our own way. And yeah, that's a huge challenge and it can be overwhelming, especially at first when you don't know why you wrote the book or what it was all about or, you know, um, and you're just feeling drained and a bit crazy, especially if it's your first book. But you're always a bit crazy when you finish a book, I think. Um, so it can be quite difficult and it can be quite challenging, but it's an incredible opportunity. And I think it's only writers who didn't have it who actually appreciate how marvelous it is that we do have this opportunity. I love that. It's funny, um, not even an hour ago, there's a, a, on a friend's Facebook profile, I don't want to name the friend, but... Um, but she's a very well-known author and, you know, she said, oh, I'm finally no longer anxious about my book. And that's because now I've transferred all that anxiousness to my next book that's going to be coming out. <laughs> and it's, it's said, and, and she is very successful. Her books are, you know, really all that sort of stuff. Like she's living the life in many ways. And yet that is her daily reality. And I think that you're right. It is this incredible um, potential stress in that way. All the things around publishing and writing and, as you said, marketing. It is also that opportunity, though, because I never would have had a chance to hear that that from her because she's not a close friend at all. She's sort of an acquaintance. And yet she has this ability to communicate totally honestly with the people in her little network in that way. And that's even that little thing is a reminder to me that she's got a book coming out. It's a reminder to me that she's a human being. It's a reminder to me that success does not take away that human fear that we all have. And it's a great example to me of here is someone who is very good at communicating in a way that feels totally authentic, that isn't marketing, that is not copywriting. It is just her being like, let me get this off my chest a little bit to my Facebook friends. Yeah, fantastic. And I think the other thing that's really powerful that we don't do enough, and I'm speaking to myself here as well as everybody else, and it's summed up in that brilliant book by um, Austin Clone, um, Show Your Work. Um, people love to see the process behind the making of a book. And just by being honest about what you're going through as you do it, as you make it, just putting snippets out, showing photographs of, of your study, you know, what you got up to that day, um, a little bit about the character development. It can be anything, but you can, by, again, satisfying a sort of a need of your own. And I think this is the key to, to you know, doing that sort of reach out writing the key is to find some need of your own that it satisfies. So, you know, if you're not the kind of social media person who, who you know, enjoys sharing trivialities, then don't. If you don't like reading them, then don't share them. But find some need of your own that is kind of scratched by social media and uh, start doing it. And it's the regularity and the constant, you know, with this type of writing. It isn't about any one post anyone update it's it's about getting really really regular and consistent so that people know what to expect and you're building up a picture of that coming book in their mind or indeed the book that you've already written or or a number of them but you as an author and and what you're writing so i mean i know dan you're super consistent you have your friday news that goes out um all the time like clockwork do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah, I, I started sending a newsletter out. I've sent it out every week for, I think it's about 14 years now. And this is something I started with a company I worked for. I emailed it to nine friends and that felt terrifying at the time. And um, I've just done it every Friday. And what I what I've found is that it pushes me. It pushes me to create on deadline. And I have tried all, I've written poetry. I've done posts that are just images. I've done videos. Um, and I've done all, all different things, and it's really been great to write outside of my normal writing and to put it out there. Um, and it's funny because it, it allows me to play as a creator. I was telling someone the other day, but one of my most popular posts that people still bring up a lot is, um, my dad lives down in Delaware, it's about two hours away, and my brother lives down there too. And we met in the middle at this really famous sandwich shop 
in New Jersey and it's the worst location, but they make these sandwiches that are like this thick. I saw and, it. It's thick. <laughs> yeah. And my, my dad is, um, he's old school. He's from the Bronx. So he, <laughs> I'm sorry for my, my, the listeners, but he, he got a tongue sandwich. It's like a kind of meat. And um, I just wrote a post about this unusual deli, about why you spend $24 on a sandwich, why they drove 100 miles to get there, why this disgusting sandwich was so important to my dad. And that post, um, I thought it was like weird. I'm like, I hope people don't unsubscribe. It's photos of my dad in this weird place and the cake that was this big. And people loved it. And I think it was because it was a very human way of looking at marketing and branding. And I never would have known that if I only said, I'm not, I'm not going to have a, a weekly deadline. I'm not going to try new things. I'm just going to, I'm going to do a top 10 tips authors need for Amazon. And I'm going to present that at a conference once a year. Um, by having the newsletter and now I have like a weekly podcast too, which used to be monthly. I find it pushes me to create. It pushes me to write more. It pushes me to play in areas that are going to be always on the sideline. And it allows me to test ideas that might become really big. Um, and you had asked this question earlier, but I, I didn't really answer it, which was like, where did Be The Gateway come from? It came from, I, I run this mastermind group and I do a daily video there. And one day, one summer, I randomly did one called Be The Gateway. I made it up as I recorded the video and people in the group liked it. And I said, oh, maybe I'll do a blog post. And I wrote a blog post to the newsletter and people liked it. And I said, huh, maybe I should expand this. And I, my goal was to write a 20,000 word quick, self-published book. It ended up being more than double that. But the book came from me just, I mean, I was it was a video, but just writing. And that's what I think is so great about the idea of what we're talking about here, almost marketing, but viewing it from the standpoint of a writer, if you are writing more often. Absolutely. And video and audio, I think, have to be taken into our big writing bucket now. You know, so we're all doing different forms of communication and videos go out with transcripts, you know, and and, and blog posts are, are then, you know, worked up into video courses and uh, audio comes in audiobook form or podcasting or whatever. And these different formats are very fluid and draw on slightly different parts of the creative process, but that the mix allows us to do an awful lot. So you can hear there that Dan is doing his weekly text blog post, he's doing his podcast, he's doing a daily video. So that's a lot of content. Out of that will come all sorts of other things. And it's the same for me. Uh, and we do different um, formats. You can use different kinds of ways to reach people. So, for example, for me with poetry, I use Instagram, which is a, a visual site, but I use it for I take a photo and I do a haiku poem, which is a sort of a, a verbal snapshot. Oh, and then I alternate that with quotes, which are done in a, in a kind of a handwriting font, quotes for poets. And so Instagram has become, it's, it's relatively recent for me, become my social media for poetry. And that takes people to my Patreon page, where which is quite poetry centered. Whereas Work for Ally is very often video on Facebook Live, hello, and uh, podcasts. And we we also have a daily blog as well. So when you're doing a number of different formats, you find that you can do an awful lot more and one feeds the other and you're just getting getting more stuff out there. And I think that's the key to reaching people. It's, you know, not being afraid of your own flow and build allowing that to build over time and going with that flow. And yes, you will be afraid. Sorry. Yeah, you will be afraid, but not letting that fear stop you just going and and doing it anyway. Um, did you find with you it's been a build over time that you're doing more and more with less time? Oh my goodness, yeah. And something I talk a lot about with writers is just the idea of how to focus your creative energy and how to say no to things and then how I do my schedule, how I, how I work in what I call white space, which is space in between things. Um, and I think these things are critical. And I, I think overall, what we're talking about this idea of making creativity a central part of your life overall. Absolutely. I think that when you look at people who are successful, I have a, I have a wall of, of writers and artists and creators who inspire me. And 
I've studied their lives and it's like, they live creative lives. They do different, uh, different things. My wife is an artist. She is primarily a painter, but she does all this other work too, because it just allows her to explore in different ways. Um, I was watching this documentary about Kate Bush not long ago, and I had not realized that she was also a dancer. And when she was sort of getting started and it totally changed her stage show and how she thought, and it was just astounding to see someone exploring the the message of their music and these all these different ways it was really amazing to see what happens when you give yourself permission to create and then where that leads beyond well here's my word count in scrivener and scrivener then it goes to my publisher and here's the step where it's all like really regimented where it's like no you have permission to just live in this world and these ideas all the time and they can come out in all different kinds of ways yeah absolutely i think other artists are better at that than writers i think it's because we work with words and we we queue up the analytical side of ourselves more um, and we can get lost on that side of things sometimes where we get very very um regimented as you say and with commercial pressures particularly in in publishing now to write more and get more stuff out and you know, uh, sell more and, and all of that kind of thing. We can get very caught on on that side of the house and we can learn a lot, I think, from people outside of the writing field by looking at artists in, in other arenas and indeed by looking at other change makers and activists who are working from a sense of passion and purpose. I, I count that as the creative class, if you like. It's much wider than just what we conventionally label creativity. So, um, yeah, if anybody has any questions specifically about the topics we're talking about here or about your own marketing, uh, your own way, you know, that you have been approaching it or would like to approach it, please do um, send your questions through in the comments. We have about another 10 minutes to go, so we have time to take some questions. But yeah, do you do you would you agree with that that writers are can can get lost in the um the wrong side of the brain sometimes? Yeah, I think each each craft has their own way of doing it. I know a lot of artists who get lost in scrolling through Instagram. I know a lot of musicians who get lost in just nine hours of noodling from midnight to nine a.m. <laughs> um, but you're right, writers have that other way of doing it as well. And it's like, there's the opportunity that comes with the way we're connected now. You have the opportunity to publish more often, but the the problem is you're, and you're saying this too, we have so much more information that it can freak us out. You can, you can do so much right, but you're also aware of the 400 other things you haven't done. And that kind of weighs on your brain. <laughs> so you could be doing awesome, but you could still feel bad about what you haven't done or what you haven't done as good as the next person, that thing as well. Um, which is why I love the idea of, of starting with the creative process of, and of creating more. I, I think the biggest thing that pains me is when you talk to writers who aren't writing, they can't fit it in or they say, oh yeah, 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 I mean, yeah my next book is done. You know, it's copy edit. You know, it's like they've now reserved three years between writing a book to, to doing anything else creatively because they're now in the publishing process. And I think that's a shame because they have these things they can be exploring and playing with and doing. And that's not just good for marketing. I think it's good for the human being. Absolutely. And and that's what we're talking about here, I think, isn't it? It's it's that whole idea that we probably do this in order to be creative. And then as soon as we're there and we've somehow managed to give ourselves enough permission to put words on paper and told people we're doing it or, or managed to sneak off uh, often enough, we become frightened almost by that possibility. Um, and the thing with reference to what you just said there, I think it's really important to realize that the creative process is a process of selection and commitment as well. It is about deciding, even if it's just for now, I'm going to explore and experiment with this, but I'm going to give it my all. I'm not going to line up 25 different things to do and go bang, 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 bang through them at a very superficial sort of level, because by definition, creativity means taking a bit of a dive, you know, going in there and giving some essential kind of part to yourself, part of yourself, I should say. We have a few questions here. Julie 
uh, says it would be helpful if we didn't have to jump through so many hoops for all the different platforms, all the formatting and publishing process, the different pricing, reporting arrangements take too much time. I think that's very true that the publishing side, on the publishing side, we can, uh, we do, we're not quite there with the tools that allow us to publish wide. We could, we could do with some help on that. Um, do you have any tips or tools there, Dan? No, but I, I will say, I think that's part of the, I think that's part of any creative profession. If I think of my podcast to get it on Google and iTunes and all these different things, they're all separate in some ways. Some you can combine with Libsyn, but then like it's, it's a mess and I am okay with that. And I think it's because of what you said earlier, which is in the past, we didn't have the option at all. The fact that you can publish it all and get an audience outside of your town still mind blowing to me. It's a, it's a worldwide audience. And yeah, it would be great if we can get on all the platforms all at once. We have these options. Um, but that would come with its own headaches because then it might be one, one monstrous company is controlling it all. And then they're doing something else we don't like. So now we hate the system. Um, I agree. It's frustrating. I agree that it means you've got to become more of a technical expert than you'd like. But I guess I'm a little more glasses half full, just that we have this magical opportunity to share our work so broadly. And I do think tools are getting better and better and all that sort of um, practical stuff gets easier and easier to do. I mean, if you wanted to before publish a book, you needed a printing press. If you wanted to make a video, you needed <laughs> the a production. is all over your hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then it really took time and a lot more people. So and these tools just keep on getting better and better. So I, 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 I have faith that they, it will get ever easier on that side. What doesn't ever get easy is that meeting your own creative self and stretching yourself. Because again, by definition, creativity will make you anxious. It will make you feel like you've, you're, you know, you're gone past some boundary because that's that's what it's all about. Well, I will just Cast say with that though, like I started yeah. buying typewriters recently. I've got a couple behind me. When you type on a typewriter, you realize how magical word processors are. Oh, yeah. And it kind of reminds me of in the 90s, I produced like a, a, a music fanzine and I would stay at the copy shop all night, which was magical. And you'd have to lay it out and then you have to distribute it because you're your own distributor. So you'd like get in your car, your bicycle, go around to record shops and leave it in the door and no one cared about it. Just this idea that you can publish on Amazon or whatever is still so much better than staying up all night at the copy shop and then hand delivering it to your local shops and watching people just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Julie, they were hoops. You think you got hoops? <laughs> no, it's such a good question. I don't mean to put down the question at all. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I know Julie, she'll only be laughing at that. And um, Kathy has two part-time jobs, teaching and writing, wants to know, um, you know, is finding the time thing. Now, I know this comes up for you all the time with authors because uh, it does for, for us to quick tip. And she also wants to know, how do you know when to take the leap? You take the leap now, period. Um, the quick tips I think are something I, I wrote about this recently. Do the minimum amount you can every day or every week. Set a, a, a remarkably, pathetically simple goal. And the example I use for that is I've, I've decided a year and a half ago to finally learn how to properly play guitar instead of just messing around with it. And I set a goal for myself of at least one minute a day playing guitar. And there are plenty of days in the last year I literally picked it up for a minute, I, I strummed a G chord, almost in just like spite and put it down. But most days I would do nine minutes, 10 minutes, 28 minutes, 38 minutes. And what happened with that is that I realized in a year, if I'm doing a few minutes a day, I'm building that skill. And even more than that, you're thinking about your story between those four minute chunks each day. So that's my quick tip on how to think about creating more with very little time. Fantastic. And my tip is do your most creative thing first in the day. So, you know, I don't I know you probably say I've got a baby or this or that or whatever, whatever your situation is, just do something so you can get 10, 15, 20 minutes where you can do the thing that is most challenging for you before you do anything else. Because as soon as you start doing other things, chances are it won't happen that day and it won't happen the next day. And when things don't happen for a little while like that, this great ridge of resistant and horrible energy kind of builds up inside you. And it's a huge drain on your creative capacity. 
Um, so I would say, you know, whatever is most important, most creative, do it first. And my other big tip is meditate. I think it really is brilliant at, you know, reminding us what's most important to ourselves, just stopping and taking that time, giving the mind, the thinking mind, a bit of rest and a bit of space is intensely clearing and if we do that i find that and free writing is another great practice that over time we shift and we change our priorities because really that's what we're talking about here is what am i choosing to spend my time on what are my top priorities um how do we aim for balance between the practical admin side and the writer artist exploration side that's from Britta. I get some flack for this, but this is the way I frame it for myself. Um, I don't believe in balance. I believe in obsession. So I think that if you split those two things, you want to do, as you just said, of really focusing the creative work first, going right into it, um, finding a way to allow yourself to obsess over it. Maybe that means you do a four minutes in the morning between dropping your kids off from school and going to your long day job, but you need to think about it. And the marketing side is sort of the same thing, which is figuring out what is the the single most important thing for you to do instead of the well they say i have to blog i've got a new newsletter i've got to be on facebook and it's sort of like you're kind of barely everywhere of just saying i'm going to really show up here or i'm really going to forge connections with members of this community and really go all in on that you know the creative work and then specifically maybe one or two things you're going to do on the quote unquote marketing side and allow yourself to be obsessed with those two things. I think you'll get a richer experience and you'll kind of learn more in the process as well. Fantastic. Okay, we are out of time, I am afraid. That was a great first uh, discussion on creative writing. Um, this um, podcast and Facebook Live session is facilitated by the Alliance of Independent Authors. For those of you who don't know us, we are an association for self-publishing writers, a membership organization, and we would love to have you as a member. And we have lots of ways that you can get your other questions answered as members. And if you have any questions on that, just find us at allianceindependentauthors.org and you will find Dan at wegrowmedia.com or on social media at Dan Blank. And his book, his great book, which I can highly recommend, is called Be the Gateway. So we will be back in a month's time um, here on at uh, 6 p.m. London time on the second Tuesday of the month, if you're around then. And if you've signed up for our podcast on our podcast page in the self-publishing advice center that selfpublishingadvice.org forward slash podcast then you'll get a reminder of the sessions thank you very much for being with us today and thank you dan 